been looking at it in detail. Lorraine, I hope you brought enough for everyone to share. That's my lunch. Not sharing. Not sharing. No, I don't uh, share my food. But you can look at it and salivate. <laughs> Carrots. Uh, apricots. Orange. Left over from last night. You make a nice challenge. Thank you. I'll be right back. Rabbi Weissman, this is uh, Eleni Litt, and I, I just wanted to thank you for offering this fantastic class. I know we're, we're just about to start. I'm Zooming in from Princeton, New Jersey, and Welcome. Uh, I have a great interest in Honi and uh, have done some uh, artist state midrash work and uh, on, a, on Honi. So I'm, I'm just so appreciative for this class that has that is covering so much wonderful material. So I just wanted to thank you. Well, I'm so happy that you're here. Can you share with us, how did you find us? Um, well, uh, I think it must have been listed on my Jewish learning. You know how yeah. my Jewish learning aggregates? And yeah, they have their, like, I forget, they call it the something, the, the swamp or the whatever, where you put all the so there's a mailing list and they, they send out, uh, you know, every day, every other day. Uh, these may be of interest. And, and uh, yeah, when I see the word honey, uh, yeah. So maybe sometime I'll have an opportunity to share my book of honey with you that I have. I, I would love to connect. Let's connect that one. I would, I would love that. We I would love that. It's definitely a very, and I'm, you know, knew a lot about it. I have learned a lot more from the, from the, the prep I put into putting this together. It's a very interesting story. It absolutely is. And I'm wondering if your handouts are made, can you make them available to us? Your the slides, you mean? Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, all they are are translations that I pulled off of safaria.org. Like exactly. These. But you have the list. I mean, you have the list of, uh, you know, how you're entering it and, and the text that you're using. That would be sure. Great. Yeah, I can, I can put together for next week, like a final, like these are the awesome. we have two more weeks. Two more weeks, but the the, the source the source material itself, yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Well, with that, I want to welcome everybody. It is now twelve oh one and something, so uh, it is the lunch hour. And if you like Lorraine, uh, brought your lunch, you should feel free to eat it. I get to starve through one more hour before I get my lunch break because I can't teach and eat at the same time. I tried once, did not go well. Um, and so I want to welcome everyone to the third installment of our exploration of Honey the Circle Maker. Uh, and uh, today. We are going to find our way making the journey into the Talmud Yerushalmi, also known in some circles as the Palestinian Talmud, also known in some circles as the Jerusalem Talmud, but the Talmud that was put together uh, by rabbis who were living in the land of Israel in the centuries after the destruction of the Second Temple. But I'm getting to where we were going before we actually get there. Um, so with that in mind, everyone can see this, the slide. Well, good. All right. Just as a reminder, I'm going to try to ask everyone to stay on mute unless you are actively participating. So if I mute you, uh, it's not because I don't like you. It's because I don't want to hear you chewing. And that's OK. Um, and so we're going to begin uh, with uh, just a few words. Uh, as I said every week, uh, that this course is in, in given in part of memory of Rabbi Dr. Aaron Pankin, uh, who was my teacher and leader of of our movement for a long time, and whose research uh, into Honi, and particularly the literary development of the story that we're going on, uh, much credit has to be to his work that was published um, in Telling Retelling of Honi the Circle Maker and the development of the rabbinic narrative discourse, um, which you can get from a book called From Scrolls to Traditions. Um, that the translations for the most part are from safaria.org, um, uh, although there's some places where I will touch on uh, different translation and translation notes as well. Um, and, you know, we've been exploring this question of who is Honey, right? What motivates him to do what he does? Who does he see himself as? And who do the authors or the editors or the redactors of the texts in which we engage with him, how might they see him or how might they want us to see him through the ways in which they frame their story? Is he a martyr, as we saw in the version of Onias and Josephus, who was killed for what he did? Is he a prophet who can speak God's words? Is he a magician or a miracle worker who can do things that are outside of God's control? 
is he a pious man who prays to God and who can then, you know, bring God to do what he wants because of his piety? Is he a charismatic holy man who can do things uh, in a religious way that is not in keeping with the way that God would have done them? Is he a devout man who simply prayed on behalf of the community and got done what he needed? And the answer is, as we have seen, is, well, it depends on who you ask, right? And it depends a little bit on the author of the version of the story. Um, and, you know, just to give us a little bit of, of context on our journey, we are going to be culminating next week and the week after with what becomes the authoritative version of the story, the telling of the story in the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, we're not going to get there quite yet. And so, you know, I am framing this entire conversation with that's the story that becomes the story of the Jewish tradition. The version of Honey the Circle Maker as presented in Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, is the authoritative one, in part because the Babylonian Talmud is the authoritative text from the rabbinic period that becomes the one that we all act on, which isn't to say that what we learn about Honey in the, the Yerushalmi today, or what we learned in the Mishnah, or what we learned in Tosefta, or what we can get from Josephus, and I just listed these texts uh, in opposite order, right? These are the various versions that we're going to explore. Not that these texts aren't meaningful. They do teach us something. But the rabbinic tradition is one, um, and I'll take a little aside in this moment. Uh, I've shared this, this thought before, um, but what is the what is the most important text in the Jewish tradition? If you're muted, please unmute to answer. Margaret, I think I saw you mutter an answer to yourself that we couldn't hear. Well, the Torah. Right. The Torah is the most important, the holiest, the text that is closest to God. But what is the text that is the authoritative text in the Jewish tradition? The Talmud, I guess. The, yeah. The Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud in particular. Or as Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz, whose yard site we just passed, so eloquently taught that when it comes to Judaism, the Torah is the foundation, but the Talmud is the edifice, the building in which Judaism lives and breathes. And so the interesting interplay there is that the oldest text is the holiest and most important, but the development of the conversation from Torah through the prophets and the writings and then the Mishnah and the Tosefta and the Yerushalmi and ultimately the Babylonian Talmud, the development of that is also important. And so the dialogue or the trialogue or the quadrilogue or the pentalogue or the whatever between these various texts helps us understand the ultimate arrival point, the Babylonian Talmud, in ways that if you just open up the story of Honi, and read it in the Babylonian Talmud, as we did on the first day, you're going to get a lot about who this guy was. But you're going to get even more about him if you take apart and understand what the rabbis who contributed to and the authors of the texts and the redactor and the editor who arranged the Babylonian Talmud in the way it was arranged, that they were informed by Josephus and Tosefta and Mishnah and the Yerushalmi. And if you understand that, you get an even greater understanding for who this guy Honey was and how he came to be, right? And whether it's you believe that God was the ultimate editor and redactor because God revealed the Babylonian Talmud in its entirety to Moses at Sinai and passed on those teachings through the generations, or you believe what a historian would tell you, which is that, no, there were some rabbis who sat around in the 6th and 7th and 8th and 9th centuries and organized edited and redacted the Babylonian Talmud to frame the conversation in a certain way. And the proof that I would suggest for someone who wants to see it in that way is that if you look at the dialogues that take place in the Talmud, right, all of the rabbis who are speaking in the Gemara are responding to statements that were made in the Mishnah, right? They respond directly. They bring in outside sources like from the Tosefta, where we call that a Baraita, when the rabbis of the Gemara use a Tosefta to respond to a Mishnah, it's called a Baraita. They may use a Midrash, or they might cite a, a, cite a verse of Torah, or of prophets, or of writings. But the most intriguing thing to me is when, for example, you will have a rabbi 
who lived and died in the fourth century, responding to a statement given by a rabbi who lived and died in the sixth century. Now, there are only two ways that that could happen. One way is that God knew what those rabbis were going to say long before they said them. And so as God revealed Torah to Moses, it just followed. That's how the statements were going to come to be. Or there was an editor who arranged these various statements from the various rab rabbis to advance the dialogue, to advance the, the learning and the study in such a way that the end result was important and not necessarily the order in which each statement came to be. Okay, having said all that, a quick review. Josephus was late, late, late before the changeover from BCE to CE and into the early parts, was a Jewish guy, a historian for what history was at the time, who then switched sides and joined the Romans, uh, basically when they captured him and they made him. He said, either join us or we'll kill you. And so he did. And so offers the story of Onias, a righteous man, who prayed for rain and made it rain. It bothered people. He got stuck in political in political conflicts. He was murdered because of it. Um, but we begin to see a few of the themes, right? A few of the themes that we begin to see um, are, he was a righteous man, a beloved of God. He prayed for rain and the droughts. It set the setting of the events as the time approaching Passover, which was important because it was at the end of the rainy season. The community wouldn't be panicking about lack of rain in late October or early November because they still have the entire rainy season ahead of them. But if it gets to late March, early April, and the rains haven't come yet, that's when you begin to have really panic panicking. So Josephus, uh, Onias, God sent rain and too much rain sent, and then there was a whole squabble among the community. The first quote unquote rabbinic version. So Sephus Ha'anit a very brief, a very terse telling of the story of a chassid who was told, they said to him, pray that rains will fall. He prayed and rains fell. They said to him, okay, turn it off now. That's too much rain, turn it off. He said, let's go and see if we have enough rain. So they went up on high to this place where the community might have gone to, Karen Ophel, either a place of like lost things or some kind of whatever, but some communal place that was up on the high hill to say, oh, if from up there the waters are getting so high, we know we have enough rain, right? And we wouldn't want to have too much rain that we would flood the earth. And we know that because of the proof text that we get from Genesis where God said, I'm not trying to kill anybody, just trying to make there be enough rain, right? And the presumption is that the Tosefta predates the Mishnah, even though they're from the same era, because of the terseness and lack of development in the story that we see in Tosefta as compared to the Mishnah, which we studied last week, right? Similarities and differences between Josephus and Tosefta, similarities praying for rain and response and too much rain and for relief. But the difference is that in, the, in Josephus, we name the guy. Now his name is Onias, right? A Greek or a, a Hellenized version of the name Choni, but you can hear etymologically connection as opposed to a general righteous man. Although the Tosefta suggests the righteousness of him as well. The Tosefta doesn't mention Passover and has this idea that they're checking to see is there enough rain based on where it flowed up. Now, last week, I'm going to read it fairly quickly. The Mishnah adds, in general, there is a crying out or a sounding of the shofar for any trouble that should befall the people, meaning anything that could happen except for an overabundance of rain. One doesn't cry out for an abundance of rain because having too much rain is in itself a blessing. And they tell the story of Choni Hame'agel, who he said, pray that rain should fall. He said, okay, go bring in the ovens that you're using to make your Passover matzah. Because, or, or, no, excuse me. Oh, oh, I just, oh, Freudian slip. Freudian slip, Freudian slip. It was not the Passover matzah. It was okay. the ovens for, for cooking the Paschal offering, which situates the telling of this story in a particular, not only time of the year, but in a particular era when the Paschal offering would have taken place. Philip, I'm happy to share the slides with you at a certain point as opposed to you taking photos uh, if, you, if you don't need them. Um, and these texts are all available. These are just download from safaria.org where these texts come from. I'm I can share all of that. 
So he says, bring in the ovens. They're going to get ruined. There's going to be so much rain, it's going to flood everything. He prayed and no rain fell. So he drew a circle around himself, earning himself the name the circle maker, and stood in the middle of the circle and said, Ribona shall oil him, master of the universe. Your children have turned to me as I am like one of your household, kind of, kind of haughty. And I swear an oath by your name that I will not move from this place until you have mercy upon the children and answer their prayers for rain. And a little bit of rain began to fall. And he said, uh, Zeloma speak. That's not Ganug. Like, not Ganug. And we need more. We need actual rains, torrential rains, to fill the cisterns and ditches. It hasn't rained all season. We don't just need to wet the ground. We need enough water that we can collect to get us through the dry season. And the rains began to fall furiously. He said, I didn't ask for this much, but rain of benevolence, of blessing, and generosity. Not destructive rain, but filling rain. So the rains fell in their standard manner. Not with wind, or rain, not torrential, not hurricane rain. A nice summer storm. <clears throat> filling the city with water. And so there was so much that they had to go up onto the Temple Mount, the high Mount Zion, the high place in the land, because there was so much rain around. And then they said, okay, turn it off, please. It's too much. That's enough. And so he prayed that they should stop. And he said, go to this stone up in the city to see whether it had been washed away. And if not, it was enough. And so it turned off. And now we begin to see tension between the rabbinic leadership and this guy, Choni. Shimon ben Shetach, the Nasi of the Sanhedrin, the chief rabbi, right? And chief ego guy all at the same time, said to Choni, if you were not Choni, I would have ostracized you. But what can I do? You're able to mitnaheg. You can mitnaheg. You can nag God and get what we want from Him, from God. So I can't get too mad at you, like a son who nags his father, and the father does the bidding. After all, the rains fell as you requested, and so it says in Proverbs: Let your father and mother be glad, and let her who bore you rejoice. All right, that's where we ended last week. We are now going to fast forward two to three hundred years to a version of the Talmud, the Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud, which comes from the land of Israel, is organized a little bit differently than the way that the Babylonian Talmud is organized. Having It has the same, and we learned these words of last week, the same Masechtot, the same tractates, right? So topically, it follows the Mishnah. So we're in Ta'anit, right? So if we go from Mishnah Ta'anit to Talmud Yerushalmi Ta'anit, right? We're still talking about the same area, the public fasts that would happen when there was a lack of rain. And the Jerusalem Talmud in general uses chapters and, you know, chapters and numbers are three, nine, just like we saw in, in the Mishnah as opposed to what we're going to see in the Babylonian Talmud, which organizes by page number and then the A side and the B side. All right. So just a few sort of categorical notes about the Yerushalmi before we jump in. First of all, its structure is similar to that of the mission, as we're going to see. But it uses some of the material from the Tosefta. There's a lot more in the Mishnah, but there are places where it introduces um, stuff from the Tosefta. But from the very beginning, we see a departure in how the story starts than from how the Mishnah started. How did the story start in the Mishnah? What were they talking about? I don't know, probably. Maybe it was a dry season. I don't know. It was a dry season, and they begin with this question, this general question in the Mishnah. What are the things the community will cry out about or call itself together or blow the shofar to say? Remember, we are in Ta'anit. We are in about public fasts. What are the things that are so bad that the community needs to, to bring itself together to engage in something like a public fast or something else because it is so disastrous? Right. And it's everything except what? Having too much rain. That's the one thing they wouldn't do. That's how the Mishnah begins. 
In the Yerushalmi, it begins in a very different place. It begins with the story of some rabbis. Rabbi, she, Rabbi Jonah, Shimon Bar Abba, in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, the thing about of which it is impossible to say genug, that is blessing. Rabbi Barachi, Rabbi Chelbo, Rabbi Abba Bar Eli, in the name of Rab, until your lips will wear out saying, we have had enough of blessings, we have had enough of blessings. So in the Mishnah, they're, they're talking about calamities. And they say, and the one thing that isn't a calamity, which you might think is, is the overabundance of rain. But in the Yerushalmi, they move the conversation away from the negative and the calamities, and they say, if there's anything that's a blessing, it's it, you can never have too much. You can never have too much of a good thing. And what is the good thing you can never have too much of? Blessings. Rain. rain. You can never have too much rain. Why not? Could you imagine, could we imagine there being too much rain? Yes. 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 Yeah. We, we have seen, especially in our time and place, what the calamity of too much rain can bring. So how can the rabbis, where do they get off saying that there could never be too much rain? What do they know that we don't? They're in a very dry region. I guess. And so they're in a very dry region, right? If you were in California right now, you might say you can never have too much rain. But who saw video from Las Vegas two nights ago? Anybody? Right? David's in Las Lake Vegas. Me. So David, what's going on in Vegas right now last couple of days? Lake Mead is drying up, but that's been a while. No. Well, no, within the last couple of weeks, actually, it's, it's actually since the start of these three classes, uh, we've actually had rain every other night. Oh, really? Every other night for in Good. downtown Las Vegas is actually flooded out. Uh, Lake Me Mead has actually gone up th three inches. Three inches does not sound like a lot, considering it's down 121 feet. But three inches is like three weeks worth of water that we can have now in, in our community. And it's it's just uh, it's just been tremendous. It it seems to me like uh, um, the rains come about seven thirty, eight thirty every night, and every night I get up, open up my patio door, and go stand in the rain. It is so wonderful because we haven't seen it in years. So on the one hand, David, and I really appreciate you giving your personal context that for most people, the rains are a machaya, right? They're a blessing. They're Filling Lake Mead in three inches. Lake Mead is, I mean, that, that's a lot of water, even though it's yeah. down so much, you're absolutely right. And you're enjoying it. But I would also suggest if you look at some of the news stories, you see Las Vegas Boulevard, water flowing down Las Vegas Boulevard right. and flooding in the hotels and the casinos, water pouring through the roofs, pouring onto the casino floor and onto the and onto some of the tables, which like is not a comment on 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 casinos or gaming or whatever. But just the idea is that there was so much rain there that the infrastructure in place cannot handle it. There is more rain than the infrastructure is able to deal with, whether that's the strength of the roofs of the building or their, you know, their, you know every, everything is designed to, to, when it rains, to bring water away from places where you don't want the water and to collect water in places where you do, like Lake Mead, um, but not on the floor of the sands. The sands isn't there anymore, but like not on the floor of, of the MGM, right? The water should be going elsewhere. In the same way that in all of our homes, right? We have roofs that are sloped towards gutters and downspouts to get the water where it's supposed to go, right? You want water to be where it's supposed to be and not where it's supposed to be. But where did the rabbis say? How can the rabbis say? What do they know to say there could never be too much rain? The answer is in the Tosefta. I'm going to I'm going to pull it back up and see if you can find it. how do the rabbis know that there will never be too much there could never be too much rain. Bobby, go ahead. Well, it's never going to be a flood again. How do we know that? Because God said there will never That's exactly be right. We pray again. that rains will not fall, but we are sure that God is not bringing a flood ever again. Because God said in, in Genesis, 
I won't do that again. So the rabbis, right now we're talking about, you know, the number of, of millennia between the time of Noah and the time of the rabbis is multiple millennia. And we are, you know, we're in a place, we are somewhere around um, about 2,000 years between the giving of Torah at Sinai and when the, when the Talmud was redacted. And so the rabbis know as an article of faith because of these teachings that come to us from the book of Genesis, that no matter how much rain comes, total destruction is not coming. That doesn't mean there might be some people who lose their lives. That doesn't mean there might, there might be some things that get damaged. But we can deal with that. We can rebuild. Right. And not like in Florida, when we, you know, when you, I'm sure many of you have seen those memes. I love this. When, you know, when when there's a hurricane that might be coming and we all have to, and I know some of you are not in South Florida. And let me just, for those of you who don't know, tell you what happens. So what happens in South Florida is for like a week, we're all watching the cone on the news. Are we in the cone? Are we out of the cone? And are we in a hurricane, a, a, a tropical storm warning or a watch or whatever? And we have to gird ourselves and board ourselves up and put everything. And then God willing, the storm doesn't come. And then someone finds that lovely photo of some lawn furniture. It's like a lawn table and four chairs. And one chair is tipped over. And we say, and the, 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 the line in the meme is, it's okay, we'll rebuild. Right? Which is what should happen at every single hurricane. At every single hurricane, let us prepare ourselves for a direct hit and be spared anything. But the rabbis have faith that no matter how much rain comes, and how much water comes, the ultimate outcome will be that those waters will recede and the community will be okay because God promised it to us in Genesis, which is how they can say that it's always a blessing. And that brings us to the story of Honey the Circle Maker. We're now in the second paragraph. It happened that they said, they, the community, said to Honey the Circle Drawer, pray for rain. He said to them, go and shelter the Passover ovens so they should not get softened, right? Now we are long past the period of there being sacrifices, but they're relaying the story as told from earlier, right? This implies that it was close to Passover. And actually, if the Passover ovens are out, what day is it? It's Erev Pesach because they're cooking. Right? It's real close to Pesach, which means in 48 hours, we're moving from praying for rain to Morid Hatal praying for dew. And so it was stated, and there's another book, Megillat Ta'anit, which is a book of it, which is another rabbinic collection about public fasts that has been lost to history, but we get citations to it in a variety of different places. So it was stated in the days before Passover or the month of Adar, 25 or four days before Passover, and Megillah's Tanis and Megillah Ta'anit, this other thing. But the Baraita says it was also this fast day, right? We'll talk about that when we get to the Babli text next week. On the 20th day, all the people fasted for rain, and it fell on them. He prayed, but no rain fell. This is what it says in Mishnah. Rabbi Yossi bin Rabbi Abun said, because he did not come in meekness, right? He didn't come and say, God, if you would please, he said, God, make it rain. Nothing happened. Rabbi Yudan, son of proselytes, said, this Onias, the circle drawer, or Choni, the circle drawer, was the grandson of Onias, the circle drawer, who lived close to the destruction of the temple. He went to a mountain to his workers. While he was there, the rain fell. He went to a cave. When he was sitting down, he slumbered and fell asleep. He stayed asleep for 70 years while the temple was destroyed and rebuilt. At the end of 70 years, he awoke from his sleep. He left the cave and found the world changed. At a place where there had been vineyards, now there are olive trees. At the place there was once olive trees, now there was a field. He asked about the province and said to them, what's news in the world? They said to him, do you not know what's news in the world? Moses Los. He said, they asked him, who are you? 
All right, we have now taken a huge departure from the story in the Mishnah. What is the huge departure? Margaret, I can't hear you if you're saying something. Well, you're going 70 years later or something, and you're going to an, a whole other thing. Well, there's so yes, what is the whole other thing? Well, the destruction of the temple. So we're 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 referring back to the destruction of the temple. When did that take place? Well, 70 AD, a B 70. That was the destruction okay. of the first temple. Okay. Yeah. And not clear. Actually, it is clear. That is not what we're talking about here. Okay. We are not talking about the seven. I think it's the 70 years between the beginning of the common era and the year 70 CE. The year 70 CE has that number has no significance to the rabbis of the Talmud because they don't count their years based on BCE and CE. Right. That is a modern Jewish way of accommodating our Christian friends so we can all be on the same page. Right. The rabbis would have talked, used our number 57. You know, it would have been 37, 30, whatever year it was, 2000 years ago. Right. The destruction that we're talking about in this piece of Talmud is not the destruction of the second temple, but the first. How do we know this? That's what I meant. Because it says. The temple was destroyed and rebuilt. The second temple has not yet been rebuilt. What temple was destroyed and then rebuilt? The first, the first temple was destroyed, and within 70 years, it was rebuilt. The second temple. The first temple was destroyed in 586 or 587, they're not really sure, BCE. That was the Babylonian exile, where prophets like Jeremiah and, and, and Isaiah talked about being in, being in exile. And there are also references to the Psalms, in the Psalms, to being in exile. But within a few generations, they return. Ezra and Nehemiah begin the reconstruction, and soon after, the temple is rebuilt. And so we're now referring to someone who lived during the time of the destruction of the first temple. This is the this is the first time that Honi is pinned down to a particular time like that. Right? We see, for example, in the text in the Mishnah that Honi lived during the time of the temple. How do we know this? Because he, the people went up to the Temple Mount to Jerusalem because of the rain, right? But it's not clear from this text which temple we're talking about. Is it the first temple or the second temple? Also in the Mishnah, we see this uh, allusion to the Sanhedrin, right? The rabbinic body. So if we're having a Sanhedrin, it might, might, might make more sense to suggest that this is from the Second Temple period, as we're beginning the transition towards the, towards the rabbinic period, which would put this five or six hundred years after the First Temple. So this text, this telling of the story in the Yerushalmi does something interesting. It placed us in a time when the temple was destroyed and rebuilt. So it tells us that Choni was living during the first temple period. But not really. What else does this passage tell us about Choni? This Onias the circle drawer was the grandson of Onias, the circle drawer. We've got two honeys now. A huge, 
huge, huge departure from the earlier versions. We now have two guys named Honey who are related to one another. Bobby. Well, how do we know that from what we just read? It sounds more like Rip Van Winkle than another Honey. <laughs> so, no, 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 no. It's both and, not either or. It's <laughs> that the Honey that the rabbis of the Jerusalem Talmud are talking about, the one that they ask to make it rain before Passover is the grandson of a guy named Honey, who was Rip Van Winkle. That Honey won, the grandfather Honey, was the one who lived during the time of the destruction of the first temple, who fell asleep before, who, during the destruction and woke up to the new temple. Okay? He experienced the, that 70 year gap. And then his grandson, Coney II, Coney II, is living contemporaneous to the rabbis of the Talmud, whom they're asking to pray for rains to come. Now, what's interesting about this, and, and if you know, is if you remember from the video we watched on the first day, that in the final iteration of the story of Coney, at the end of the story, we get a vignette that includes him falling asleep for 70 years. Not a reference to an earlier version, but it comes at the end of the story. But since some of us know a little bit about Honey, we would be, we would be remiss if we didn't notice that, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. In the Jerusalem story Talmud, Jerusalem Talmud version, A, we got two guys named Honey who are different generations, and it was the first one who fell asleep for 70 years. And he didn't seem to know where he was. And so they ask him, like Jan Janssen from Wisconsin. He says, I am Onias the circle anchor. This is the grandfather talking. They told him that when he entered the temple courtyard, right? Temple standing, it lit up. He went there and it lit up. And he recited about himself, when the eternal leads back to the return of Zion, we were like sleepers. Psalm 126. Does anyone know Psalm 126 with any reference point? Some of you may know it and not realize that you know it. How many of you have ever recited Birkat Hamazon after a meal? How many of you have recited Birkat Hamazon on Shabbat or on a festival? And know that there was the custom of adding a particular psalm before you begin Birkat Hamazon. Some of you may know where I'm going with this. Which psalm do we recite on Shabbat and on festivals before we, we sing Birkat Hamazon? It's Psalm 126. Shir Hamalot. A song of ascents. Beshuva Jonai. Literally, when the eternal et Shiva Zion, Hainu Kecholim. That's that verse. That when God brings us back to Zion, we will be like sleepers or like dreamers. And so the wonderful, wonderful rabbinic wordplay here of you have a guy who falls asleep during exile. And with, with the sandy crusties still wiping his eyes, he returns to the Temple Mount and it lights up. And he is like, like a dreamer. Right? Dreamer meaning like I, I, all of my dreams have been fulfilled. It's back. And now we seem to return to the story of Honey 2. Rain began to drip, as we read about in the Talmud, or the, the Mishnah. They said this happened only to eliminate this one's vow. What vow? Whose vow? He drew a circle on the ground and stood before it and said, Master of the universe, I take an oath by your great name that I will not move from here until you have great mercy upon your children. And so Ram began to trickle down just in small droplets. Vow fulfilled. Vow fulfilled. 
He said, that is not what I was asking for, but for rain to fill the cisterns, ditches, and caves. It rained in a raging storm, Samuel stated, as pouring from a water skin. Right? You see the Talmud is doing what the Talmud does. It's walking us line by line, word by word, through the text in the Mishnah. And so the moment the rains begun to fall, the vow that Choni had made had been fulfilled. He said, make it rain. It rained. But we know that that rain wasn't enough to actually fix the problem. So Choni says, God, that wasn't what I was asking for. I need lots of rain. And then it was too much rain. He said, it's not, that was not what I was asking for, right? He's, you know, he's Goldilocks now. Well, that's too much. That's too little. I need just enough, please. But rain of goodwill, of blessing, and donation. It rained normally until the Jews moved from Jerusalem to the Temple Mount because of the rain. Right? Now, we had said before in the Mishnah that they went up to the Temple Mount because it was high ground, which followed the teaching from the Tosefta that they had gone up to the high ground to see. The Yerushalmi adds another reason why they may have gone to the Temple Mount. This implies that the Temple Mount was covered by a roof, which apparently it was. During the Herod's construction, there was at least porticos and things around the Temple Mount that they could take shelter in. So they were taking shelter not from the flooding, but from the rains themselves. Got to stay dry. Got to stay dry. He said to them, they, excuse me, they said to him, just as you prayed for them to come, so pray to remove them. He, Choni, told them, go check whether the loser stone, that's that claimant stone, the stone where people would bring lost objects, the lost and found, go see if it's been wiped away. What was the purpose of the stone? Only that anybody who lost something could take it from there. Nobody and anyone who found it would bring it there, right? And, and Baba Mitzia, which is, the, which is the section of the Talmud about lost items. He told them that just as it is impossible for this stone to be wiped off from the world, it is impossible to pray that the rains should stop. But go and bring me a bull as a Thanksgiving offering. They went and they brought him a bull as a thanksgiving offering. He leaned on it with both his hands and said, My master, you brought evil on your children and they could not stand it. You brought benefit on their children and they could not stand it. But may it be your pleasure to bring relief. What is the evil that God brought upon the people they couldn't stand? Bobby, are you mouthing the answer? No? Well, what was the, how did the story begin? What was the original complaint of the people? No rain. Not enough rain, right? Which, if you live in an arid culture, in a dry community, where you rely upon seasonal rains to have make sure there's enough water to survive through the dry season, a drought is evil. Okay. Right? Then God brought benefit. What was the benefit that God brought? Rain. How much rain? Too much rain. Too much rain. Thank you, Margaret. God brought too much rain, and they couldn't stand it. So God now, may it be your pleasure to bring relief. No more rain. Immediately the wind blew, the clouds dissolved, and the sun shone, and the earth dried. And they went out to the, down the desert full of? Truffles. Truffles. Mushrooms. Mushrooms. Now I want to point out a couple things about this telling of the story. There are, you, you don't see this so much in the English, but there are interesting points of alliteration that if you read this in the Aramaic, it's actually quite poetic. You have, you have alliterations like Mitra and Marta about, about rains and mountains. And Samach and Samik and Ruach and Revach, right? Ruach is the wind and Revach is the relief. That clearly the person who redacted and organized this was, was taking awareness of the language they were using to use some poetic 
some poetic uh, tools as well. Now, the story of Choni one falling asleep at the temple doesn't always, that may not begin with Choni. There is another story of Avimelech, who was Jeremiah's servant, who fell asleep just before the destruction of the first temple. And he fell asleep for 66 years. And he woke up and he saw that Jerusalem was in, ex was in ruins and, his, and that his, his uh, master, Jeremiah, was exiled. He asked a question, what is the date? And he was told, oh, it's the 12th of Nisan. And in the story, he wakes up to bring about the return of the exile. This comes from a text called uh, Baruch, which is not a holy text in the Jewish tradition, but is a text of the early period from the Palestinian community, the Yerushalmi community. But this idea of the sleeper, we see in other places as well. We see it in Greco-Roman writings like Aristotle's Physics. We see it in Christian writings like the Tales of the Seven Sleepers. We see it in the Quran as well. Right, and we see it in modern language, like as Bobby put in the chat, Rip Van Winkle. Right, this idea of someone falling asleep and waking up and being a foreigner in their own land, and a foreigner in the land where their people live, is a is a common is a common literary tool that creates some tension. And as we're drawing the as we're drawing on the various texts. Of the story of Choni, we see where that comes from. All right. Now, moving back to our story of Choni and the Jerusalem Talmud. So they ask Rebbe Eliezer, when may one pray for rains to stop? Remember, are we supposed to pray for rains to stop? No. Rain is a blessing. We don't need to pray for rains to stop. Rains will always be a blessing. We have a guarantee there will never be too much rain because God has promised not to flood the earth. And so anything up to that, we should think of as a blessing. But Eliezer says, if a person stands on the top of the Ophel and his hands, or some say his feet, make noise in the, in the valley below, meaning you're splashing in the water, that's when. But we trust the merciful Father, Hakarosh Baruch Hu, Avinu Malkenu, that God will not bring a deluge over the world. What's the reason? This is to me like the waters of Noah. I swore not to bring Noah's, Noah's water at the time over the earth. I think it's a mistranslation, Noah, right? Isaiah in chapter 54 reminding us of the blessing and the promise made to Noah that the rains will never flood the whole earth. But what is Rabbi Eli, what, what reference is Rabbi Eliezer making? He's making the reference to the earlier text in the Tosefta, where he says, Go and see if a person can stand on the Karen Ophel and rinse off his foot in the Kidron River. Same idea. Different, a little bit different language, but same idea. If you can splash in the river, then you can stop praying for rain. By the way, there's a difference between stopping praying for rain, praying for the rains to stop. Here, it's the more affirmative, ask that the rain be turned off. And of course, the fear in praying for the rains to stop is it might be hard to restart them again in the future. But Rabbi Ali says that if if the deluge is getting close, then you can pray for the rains to stop. And now we move forward into the second half of the story. The Mishnah, as you know, now the, the Talmud is, is reminding us of the story of the Mishnah. Shimon ben Shetach said to him and told him, you should be excommunicated. Choni, but what can I do? Since you are misbehaving before the om omnipresent, like a son who misbehaves towards his father who does his will. It says about you in Proverbs, your mother and father enjoy, you will enjoy, and the one who bore you jubilates. Right? That's what it says at the end of the Mishnah, right? Why is Shimon ben Shetach so angry at Choni? Why does he think he, he deserves to be excommunicated? 
Well, he argued with God, and he really put himself out there. So, yeah. Margaret, I will agree with you that it has something to do with Choni's interaction with God. I mean, it's chutzpah. It's chutzpah. But you know what? Think about other people in our history. Abraham argued with God. Jacob wrestled with God. Moses argued with God. But we're in a different time now. But we're in a different time then. But this raises the question, right, of who is Choni, right? If Choni is a prophet, then not so bad. If he's a charismatic holy man who's trying to show up God, that can be problematic as well. But Shimo Ben Shetach is also worried about something very specific. Because of the oath that Choni made. When Choni says, I take an oath by your great name that I will not move from here until you have mercy upon your children. That is not an oath that one is allowed to make according to the rabbinic tradition. You can't make a public oath to make God do something. It is unfulfillable ordinarily, which is why Choni was eligible for excommunication, as Shimon ben Shetach says. But what's Shimon ben Shetach's problem in trying to excommunicate Choni for an unfulfillable oath that he made? The oath was fulfilled. Yeah, it worked. It worked. And that's the, that's the problem that Shimon ben Shetach has. Anyone else who says to God, I'm not going to make, I'm not going to move from here until you make it rain, that person is chutzpahdik, that person is making a vow that they know that they cannot complete, and therefore should be excommunication, excommunicated for making such a public affront to God. But... It rained. And so Shema Ben Shetach now has a problem here because authority is now in question. The authority of the rabbis to enforce God's rules is in question. And God's authority is in question if someone like Honey can simply draw a circle around himself and force God to do this thing that up till that point, God had decided not to do. Right? Who makes the rains fall? God. God, had it rained all rainy season. In the rabbinic mind, whose decision is it to make it rain? God. God. Who forces God's hand to make it rain? Coney. And that's a problem. That's a problem. Now, there's also a textual problem with the, with the Yerushalmi because... Tony doesn't actually make the vow in the Yerushalmi. Right? He just did it. So you have to remember that as you read the Yerushalmi text, you have to read it alongside the Mishnah. Right? Which is why the Yerushalmi, like the Bavli, tells you this part comes from the Mishnah, this part comes from the Gemara. So it reminds us that in the Mishnah, Shimon ben Shetach responded to the oath that Honi had made and said, I, I can't, like, you are, you are misbehaving before Avinu, before our, before our father God. But there are some families in which the son might misbehave and the father still does what he wants. And that seems to be the case with Honi and God. As we see in this verse in the Proverbs, your mother and father will enjoy, and the one who, who bore you will jubilate. Margaret, and then Bobby. He really did force. I mean, it's true he had chutzpah, and he dared, he challenged. Yep. But God, everybody makes a choice, and that was a choice. I decided that it was going to rain or not rain. So I don't think it mattered what Honey did. It may have been abhorrent to the people but it god chose 
So I think it does matter. Like you're right that, that God ultimately chooses to make it rain. But you just said it doesn't matter that he did something abhorrent. I didn't say it didn't matter. I mean, what I'm saying is I don't think it, we're dealing with God here. So right. what he did may not have been whatever, but God's going right. to do what God's going to do, no matter what, who does what or says what. That's right. what I'm So who is who's speaking to us as we read this text? Whose worldview, who is trying to relay their worldview to us as the readers of the of the Jerusalem Talmud? It's the rabbis, mm -hmm. right? The rabbis are the author. The rabbis are the one who are trying to convince us to see the world in the way that they see the world. And the rabbis are deeply concerned both with process and with outcomes. So there is no question that the outcome of it being raining, you can ascribe to God because Honey says to God, God, would you please make it rain? I'm not going to leave this spot until you make it rain. And so we can grant that ultimately God is the one deciding for it to rain. God could have let Honey stand there in that circle. In fact, God did it first. Bobby, I see your question. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, however, Shimon Ben Shetach is also saying to Honey, that's not how good Jews behave. Good Jews don't have the chutzpah to stand before God as an individual, right? We as a community have the thing, we have what we do when there isn't enough rain. And not this grabbing, grabbing our, our grabbing the mantle, grabbing the mouthpiece, and grabbing God by the shoulders and say, you better make it rain. That's not how we're supposed to behave. And so that is that the process by which we got to the rain is abhorrent and problematic. Bobby. Uh, would seem to me that if he wasn't a prophet, he had to be a very holy man for him to be able to even communicate, whether it was Slitzba or not, for God to listen to him. And then I wonder about the, the circle, because the form of the circle must mean something. I mean, it wasn't a square, which would be the four corners of the earth. It was a circle. So yeah. I think the circle has meaning, and I think he must have been a holy man. So there's, I mean, as we spoke about, I think, two weeks ago or a week, or a week ago, like the circle does suggest a whole lot of things. Right? We talked about last week this idea that, like, you know, when you're fighting someone, you try to encircle them, right? And you try to, to trap them. And when you trap them in the circle, they kind of have to do what you ask them to do. And and so the and Rabbi Pinkin described this so well in the piece that I read. What he said was Honey took that idea and he tried to encircle God, but you can't encircle God. So he flipped it around and he encircled himself. And he said to God, I'm not leaving here until you do this. Anyone ever seen the movie or the play A Bronx Tale? There's this really power as a little a little bit of a diversion, but it, there's this really powerful scene. The Bronx Tale is about uh, some folks, Italian folks, live in the Bronx and they're tied up with with mafia, um, to, you know, organized crime. But there's a scene where a biker gang comes to the to the bar that they hang out at, and they they're invited. You know, they kind of come in. There's some tension there. They ask if they can just have a round of drinks, and the and the Owner says, fine, who's like the boss? And then the, and then the, the biker gang makes a mess, like sprays beer everywhere, and kind of, kind of breaks it up a little bit. And the owner says, I think it's time for you to leave. And the guys say, no, we're not leaving. And so then the owner walks to the front door, and he locks the door of the bar. And he said, I asked you to leave, and now you can't leave. And all of a sudden, like 10 guys come out of the back with like weapons and they beat the snot out of these guys. And the power dynamic there, right? It was the host was being overpowered by the guests. The host was trying to be nice. And in the moment, everything turns around and all the power was drained. That's what Honey's trying to do. He needs to find a way to overpower God who chose there not to be rain, which was hugely chutzpahdik. There's no question about it. And the way that he does it is he stands in the circle and he makes this vow and he kind of calls God a chump by saying, 
listen, the people need rain. They've asked me to do this. I'm doing this on their behalf. I'm making this vow. I'm not going to leave this spot until it rains. God, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to let me stand here and let us, let us die of thirst? Or are you going to make it rain? And that was problematic because that's not the way you're supposed to do things, right? Shimon ben Shetach would have said, you don't put all the power in one person. You continue to do public fast. You blow the shofar and you wail and scream. And as a community, you, you invade upon God for the rains to come. But not in this singular fashion of drawing the circle around like that. And anyone who causes a de public declaration de Desecration of the name, as Choni did, needs to be excommunicated. That's why we have Rabbi Gamliel saying to him, if you hinder the public act, you will cause a deluge. And we're going to end here because it's one o'clock and the, in the, and the uh, recording is going to stop as well. So we will pick it up here next week. We will finish the Yerushalmi and we will make our way into the Bavli as well. There's still a few more slides of the story. It's, it gets long and it gets good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Wow. Yeah. So much information. If anybody wants to make a request of materials from me, the best way to do it is to send me an email. And here is my email. Hang on, I spoke too soon. There is my email address. And you can send me requests of materials and what there. And have a wonderful afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. You too.